Welcome to Lincoln Log, where we speak with leading historians and other officials about their stories, research, and wisdom. Expand your knowledge and indulge your curiosity here on Lincoln Log. This podcast is produced by the Abraham Lincoln Association, aiding and promoting Abraham Lincoln's life and legacy. Founded in 1908, the ALA remains the nation's oldest and largest Lincoln organization. Learn more at abrahamlincolnassociation.org. Greetings. I am your host, Joshua Claiborne, and I am pleased to welcome Harold Holzer to our Lincoln Log podcast. Holzer is one of the country's leading authorities on Abraham Lincoln and the political culture of the Civil War era. Indeed, of all modern Lincoln historians, Harold is probably the closest thing the genre has to a rock star. He has authored, co-authored, and edited 54 books, including Emancipating Lincoln, Lincoln at Cooper Union, and three award-winning books for young readers. His awards include the Lincoln Prize and the National Humanities Medal. His newly released book is titled The Presidents Versus the Press, The Endless Battle Between the White House and the Media, From the Founding Fathers to Fake News. Aside from his Lincoln scholarship, Holzer serves as director of Hunter College's Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute, and he previously spent 23 years as senior vice president for public affairs at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York before retiring in 2015. Harold, thank you so much for joining our podcast. Um, thank you. It's a pleasure. I'm still reeling from the introduction uh, as a rock star, but I guess well, if, if Mick Jagger is 80 years old, I guess it fits in a way. That's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, so let's, the, for your new book, what was really the impetus for it? And, and how did maybe your prior book, Lincoln and the Power of the Press, frame or inform this latest project? Well, it really did. I mean, I, it, 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 it took a long time. It got a very good reception. Uh, if I'm, mm-hmm. if I can say that, and um, it got the Lincoln Prize, and I um, just kept up my interest in the subject. Uh, secondarily, I've always wanted to write a book inspired uh, about my earlier career, not a memoir. But I had been a newspaper man for three years, a very young newspaper man, uh, when I got out of uh, college in 1969, and. Um, then went from there into the job of being a political press secretary for a member of Congress who ran for the U.S. Senate, uh, barely lost, and then ran for New York mayor, Mm -hmm. lost a little more decisively. And then I worked in the administration of Governor Mario Cuomo on the press relations side. So I felt uh, those three things, and I'll add a fourth. One is um, having gotten into this subject, immersed myself in relations between the Lincoln administration and the press, and Lincoln for his whole life and the press. Two, having had experience writing about politicians, even presidents and presidential candidates, because in my job as a journalist, you know, I spoke to uh, Ted Kennedy and, and right. Eugene McCarthy, and um, I actually had met Robert Kennedy as a younger man, but that's, so I was very interested in the political side. And then third, um, the interest in in the press from the book. So here's the fourth element. So as you noted, I've spent the last five years running Roosevelt House, uh, the Public Policy Institute at Hunter College in, in New York. And it's called Roosevelt House because it occupies the townhome that Franklin and Eleanor and Franklin's mother lived in for 25 years when they were in New York City, which is often. So it was from this house that he built himself up to a, a f- after his polio rec- uh, attack to the point where he could walk or imitate walking on steel braces uh, and crutches. It's here that he um, ran his campaigns for governor of New York and for president in 1932. And it was from this house that he, um, A, gave what was but doesn't count as his first fireside chat the day after election 1932 speaking from in front of his fireplace and then repeating his one minute speech for the newsreels. So mastering all these techniques at once while the press core was masked in his parlor downstairs where I walk in and out of every day when it's not a pandemic um, and it's not closed down. And, And the press intent on covering him also developed a gentleman's agreement not to photograph him on his crutches, in his wheelchair, 
um, or struggling to be lifted in and out of automobiles. So going around the media through radio, dealing with a press corps downstairs, smoking and hanging out, and the gentleman's agreement, that's all part of, I thought represented the whole interplay of journalists and presidents. So that was the fourth rung of my inspiration for this. I see. That's very good. Uh, it, it seems that uh, we once considered a lot of topics uh, such as families, finances, uh, philandering or affairs as off limits to the mainstream press. But nowadays, it really seems like everything is fair game. Do you agree with that? And if so, what caused this change in perspective? So um, can I just give one more answer to the first question? Oh, sure, I, sure. I think the, the other motivating factor was the fact that Donald Trump had what I thought was an extraordinarily hostile and ascetic relationship with the press. And uh -huh. I did want to go back and look to see whether there was any historical sense. precedent for that, which we can address. So yeah, um, I mean, the book was originally called Fake News, A History. But I see. it was decided by powers higher than I <laughs> that fake news would not be uh, in the parlance forever, which I think is probably wrong because it's been two years since I was reminded that fake news would not be in the parlance. And obviously, <laughs> right. But um, um, yeah, there was there was a change, and uh, I think uh, the change occurred, you know, after Nixon, Johnson, maybe. But Nixon was the, the watershed. The fact that the press was able to go deep into his psyche uh, and frankly catch him at a, the, the, the biggest, well, until recent times, the biggest cover up in American history, uh, the fact that he fought with them and invited their scrutiny certainly opened up, emboldened the press. Mm -hmm. and, and not only because they thought that the Kennedy era when things were kept secret was no longer relevant or possible, but because in fact they brought down a president. Um, and every journalist since, I think, everyone to whom I've spoken has understandably dreamed of having his or her own Woodward and Bernstein moment. I mean, it is not a bad thing to take down, a, I mean, it, it may be not a good thing, but it's an amazing thing to take down an American president to get a lifetime of, of lucrative book deals as a result and to be portrayed in the movies by Dustin Hoffman and Robert Redford. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. Um, it becomes aspirational after a while to meet that high bar. Right. Well, and, and Nixon is a great example of how that's changed. I guess it seems to me that war often tends to change the relationship between president and press too. I mean, would you agree? And what are some pr prominent examples maybe of how that changes the relationship a lot? Well, um, it does. Although I cite quite a few examples in the book um, it, it, during which war did not really make a difference. Um, the threat of war, a quiet war, mm. John Adams and Barack Obama inhibited uh, uh, open communication and, and worse. But yes, um, Abraham Lincoln uh, set the pace here in, uh, during the Civil War as, as I discussed in my first book and sort of caps, encapsulated in this book, during the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln declared what he described as a new war power to muzzle free speech and, uh, and uh, free press and press criticism because he felt it would injure his efforts to save the country and preserve the Union and beat down uh, a rebellion. And his argument was, um, which he put very, in very sophisticated legal terms and in very homespun terms, was that um, it was not worth, uh, it, one always took off a leg to save a body and the Civil War certainly told us that, but one never killed a body to save a leg. Kind of a gross example. And by that he meant, yes, he would abrogate a part of the constitution, um, the freedom of the press in order to save the whole constitution. Mm -hmm. Or as he famously said on another occasion, when he was pushing back against newspapers and Democrats who opposed the draft or enlistment, he said, must I shoot a simple minded soldier boy who deserts and spare a wily agitator who induces him to desert? And he 
wouldn't do the latter. And he also said in that same famous letter, the Corning letter, that he regarded some newspaper men, newspaper men as spies and traitors. Right. And yes, and on and on. I mean, in, in World War I, just to continue the thread, Woodrow Wilson not only clamped down on the free flow of news, arguing that, you know, a phrase that would become immortal and much copied, uh, giving aid and comfort to the enemy in his judgment. But he also did something even Lincoln didn't think of, and that is create a, an omnipresent propaganda unit. The Committee for Public Information under, <coughs> excuse me, the management of a newspaper man named George Creel. Mm -hmm. And they not only put out endless press releases, magazine articles, special publications, they, they just dominated so many parts of culture while suppressing news on the other hand. Mm -hmm. They even had a core, they developed a core of public speakers adept at giving one minute or 90 second speeches in support of World War I because it took 90 seconds to change the reels in silent movies from, <laughs> from reel to reel. I used to think it was seamless, just that it looked choppy, but no, it took 90 seconds. Mm -hmm. But the projection is to go to the next reel. And he had a core of people at every major movie theater in the urban areas to give a propaganda film. And the posters and, anyway, truly extraordinary. And Roosevelt did a little bit of that or a good deal of that in World War II as well. Yeah, he created what an official government news agency, or at least to try to, but then he relented, did. I think, yeah, yeah. And he dispatched the country's greatest film directors, George Stevens, Frank Capra, um, John Ford, to make films of the Allied progress against the enemy. Mm -hmm. You know, really, that became government propaganda films, I mean, in the best sense, but... Right. Well, your book really tends to focus on particular presidents. I don't, it doesn't seem to go chronologically through all of them, but it seems to touch on those that maybe particularly interesting or particularly impactful to the relationship between the presidents and the press. Is that how you chose or what was your methodology for choosing which to focus on and which not to? So I chose the ones who I thought changed relationships with the press mm. the most. So I started with um, the founding generation, Washington, Adams, and Jefferson. And then I skipped all the way to Andrew Jackson, um, who imposed quite a bit of revolutionary press tactics in his administration. But I will say that I included quite a bit on John Quincy Adams, his predecessor and his opponent in two presidential elections. And then I did Lincoln, of course. I mean, I thought maybe if I did Fillmore and uh, John Tyler, people would kind of zone out. <laughs> so Teddy Roosevelt and Wilson were obvious. They were revolutionary in their way. And then I skipped um, to FDR. I kind of wish I had summoned the nerve to do Herbert Hoover because he was so hostile to the press. So I threw him in during the Roosevelt chapter. Mm -hmm. And after Roosevelt, I, I did the next revolutionary in terms of press relations, and that was John Kennedy. Although I did some Truman and some Eisenhower. Truman because he had a one just fabulous hostile encounter with the press, and Eisenhower because he did the first television, televised news conference. Badly, but he did it, and that spiked a revolution as well. Right. Well, for obvious reasons, our listeners have a particular interest in Abraham Lincoln, and he was, of course, a master of dealing with the press. What do you think helped make him such a shrewd president in this regard? Well, a lifetime of experience, for sure. Mm -hmm. Beginning in his Indiana days, I mean, he was, I mean, by legend, by mythology, by testimony of his contemporaries, as uh, recorded by William Herndon, he was a voracious reader at a young age, just mm -hmm. insatiably hungry for the printed word. But usually the references are to his books, to his Shakespeare, to his Bible, and there is not much mention about his appetite for, for newspapers. And his stepmother attested to the fact that he read the St. Louis Democrat as a teenager. Mm -hmm. Um, the closest thing to instantaneous news that he could get on the prairie. 
Right. So he always had a hunger for news. Um, and, and he got his first sense of uh, public acclaim by writing a temperance article for a newspaper when he was a teenager. I think these are transformative events in his life as much, mm -hmm. as, as, much as, the, as the books in, inspirited him. And if you go on right. to every stage of his career, in New Salem, Yes, he was a village postmaster, and that's very quaint, but he was also uh, the recipient of all the newspapers that came in from all parts of the country to new settlers who had migrated there from other regions. And he got to read them first, and he did. And his neighbors, fortunately, were so taken <laughs> with him, they didn't complain much. And then he began working right. as the official agent of the Sangamo Journal during his New Salem days. And what did that mean? It meant selling subscriptions, maybe getting a bit of a cut for it. And of course the paper uh, represented his Whig values at that time, but also writing first of many anonymous articles uh, for the press. So he's in it from the beginning. It's the way he, he develops his interest in politics and the press concurrently, his interest in books and newspapers concurrently. And at that point, newspapers were cogs in the political machine. They weren't just news reports. So right, you can't right. have one without the other. And I think Lincoln wanted both relationships from the beginning. Right. And I guess that's really attributed. I, I think you can see that play out too after I, when he became president, his friendship with uh, um, uh, some press folks who he eventually even considered putting in his cabinet or his chief of staff, correct? I mean, I think that really right. go, underscores his interest and relationship with the press significantly. Well, can I, going back a li even earlier, um, during the days when he is uh, riding the circuit as a lawyer, even when he's out of politics, he always stops at a newspaper office, at a, at a hmm. Quake or Republican newspaper office, to shoot the breeze. There's a wonderful uh, story by a man whose uh, who's, who's autobiography I edited a few years ago for a new edition, William Osborne Stoddard, a newspaper man in Illinois. There were two ways people became newspaper men. They were either writers who became editors or they were actual printers who became editors. Mm. And Stoddard was a printer. So he would hear Lincoln coming in unannounced to his office and he was always up to his elbows in ink. He was not <laughs> always happy to see Lincoln because he stopped his work, you know, in mid labor. But Lincoln was full of news himself about political trends. He would ask the editors about political trends. He would be a presence. He walked into the offices of the Chicago Tribune to take a subscription and the editor later wrote he looked, he was wearing dungarees, which I don't believe, uh, and was kind of rustic. I mean, he was there on a law case, so I think that's just a bit much, but he sought them out. And in mm -hmm. Springfield, he hung out in the offices of what then was the Illinois State Journal, his old friend. He hung out in the office. It's where he got the news of his nomination. It's where he had his speeches, including the House Divided Address, printed so he could read it more easily mm -hmm. when he spoke. His, his first inaugural address was printed there so he could work from a printed text, or at least the, the original he later edited so much it was more. So the relationship was very, very cozy for years before he became president. Right. And then I think, uh, and I know you touched upon this a lot, but uh, in, in your, in your, in this book and in various books, but it, it, not just the relationship with the people behind the press, but really how he would utilize the technology was, I think, incredibly shrewd and, and um, ahead of his time in many ways, wouldn't you agree? And, and I say in the book that the presidents who have been the, the most masterful in communicating are those who have adapted to the newest mm -hmm. technologies and, and, I mean, we can start with Andrew Jackson, who appointed his favorite newspaper man to be postmaster general, and at the same time created a kind of a, the first wire service, news that would be taken to the post office and sent to like-minded newspapers in the West so that they could have official administration news. The postmaster general slash editor, Amos Kendall, even talked aloud about maybe, you know, impeding the the delivery of anti-Jackson newspapers. So mm -hmm. if we think that talking about misusing the post office is something new, it isn't. Uh, Lincoln, right. of course, adapted to the telegraph. 
um, in getting news out quickly. But there was another technology he was interested in. And I, we have to give Stephen Douglas credit for getting onto this first or, or his supporters. And that is the use of stenography, which was a pretty new phenomenon in, in 1858 when stenographers, Republican stenographer and Democratic stenographer recorded the Lincoln-Douglas debate so that they could appear in newspapers mm -hmm. throughout Illinois in, believe it or not, a matter of days, unheard of, to get that stuff printed so quickly. Um, so that was another technology he embraced. And by the end of his life, Lincoln was on the road with the Army of the Potomac, with Grant's army in Virginia, trying to be witness, trying to be on the scene for the end of the war. He didn't quite make it, but he was there for a lot of the end. And of course, went to Richmond uh, when it was captured by the Union. But at the same time, he was sending dispatches to the Secretary of War, uh, who happened to occupy the office next to the telegraph office. And those dispatches were getting printed on the front page of newspapers with Abraham Lincoln's byline. Mm -hmm. So he practically was the war correspondent in chief right. at the end of the war. And, and I think, you know, this is not at all a value judgment on the content of President Trump's tweets, but I think we would have to agree he recognizes that as, a, as, an, as an opportunity and avenue to bypass the traditional mainstream press. And he's probably done it again the content plays a role in how we view it, but he's, he, I think he recognizes this. there's an opportunity here far more than any other previous president has recognized and utilized. Well, I, I put him in a group of four or five who have maintained uh, relations with the working press, although Lincoln, like Trump, is pretty condemnatory to the opposition press. Let's keep mm -hmm. that in mind if right. you want to be totally honest about it. But these are the presidents I rank in that same category with Lincoln for technological acumen and focus on the press. And remember, Lincoln is also appointing journalists to federal jobs, mm -hmm. uh, giving them printing contracts, doing more than most presidents. And that's when the government printing office came into being. So there were less after that. But anyway, mm -hmm. Lincoln for sure. Franklin Roosevelt. 998 news conferences, beloved by the working press, even though he was always opposed by a majority of publishers, never got, edit never got majority editorial support for any of his four elections, despite the depression, despite the war. Okay, but he also did 28 fireside chats that riveted the nation. His voice was, you know, uh, uh, helped pe lift people from the depths of despair in the 30s and gave them assurance right, right. about the Allied fight and how tough it would be in World War II. And the next one on my list is John Kennedy, who introduced live televised news conferences staged in the State Department auditorium in a theater style venue with lights and blue curtains. And the first, I don't know if we remember this, the first podium with the seal of the president uh, to add dignity and, and command to, to, to the scene. And journalists at the time didn't like it. One of them said, it's like we were being subjected to watching Kennedy make love in Carnegie Hall. <laughs> but they got with the program, and you know why? Because they were called on so often by the president and got their own TV time that they became the first media stars. And I think they, they've done it. They liked it. it. And yeah. then I would give a, uh, some credit to Barack Obama in terms of mastering technology, because his administration introduced the first White House website. I was surprised that he, that most of the journalists who worked in the Obama White House do not hold him in high esteem. They may hold him in respect, but they felt that he uh, avoided their questions and referred mm -hmm. them too often to the, re to the website. And also, um, that he cracked down pretty hard um, on journalists, uh, was obsessive about leaking, which other presidents have been as well, including Reagan. Mm -hmm. So he uh, wiretapped a few reporters and they didn't like that. Right. And then, yes, absolutely skip to Trump. He is, I would, you know, I, I trace the first tweet he ever tweeted back when he was a real estate person. and. Uh, 
was about watching him on the David Letterman show because he had a great top 10 to announce on Letterman, if anybody remembers those uh, events. So, um, you know, they may contain lies. They may contain, you know, uh, infuriating retweets of conspiracy theories. But he, even though Barack Obama still has more followers than Donald Trump, he's, he, the tweet storms that he issues go directly to his base of support, to his followers. And worse, I think, in terms of professionalism, they inspire at least half of every day's news cycle. Right. Because every day's cable news bounces off his tweets, panels discussing, right. you know, right. did he really say that people could vote twice? Yes, he did. No, he didn't. That's another three hours of discussion. Right. He gets, so he's, he gets a lot of bang for his buck on tweets, he, doesn't he? He yeah. sure does. And the press falls into the trap every time. Yep, yep. Well, I, I, obviously, you're one of the foremost experts on Lincoln. So I, I guess if we could focus just a little bit on him. And uh, he was, of course, the first Republican president. But in the years since his death, his words have been used by politicians of all size, sides, Democrat, Republican, third parties. What is it and about all, him? And all size. All yeah. sizes, too. Yeah. Yeah. And what is it about him and his principles and beliefs that allow that to be used? Where he Was he really that variegated in his p beliefs or what um, what allows for that you know i've traced this in a book i did with uh, mario cuomo and a, a, a lecture I, I gave around the country and really enjoyed giving about how presidents have identified with lincoln and the battle between the political parties over the mantle of lincoln and it began <laughs> you know it really with uh william jennings bryan i mean he tried to see and he saw greatness in Lincoln and the Republican uh, response was quick and, and, and strong. How dare Brian appropriate Lincoln? But Woodrow Wilson did the same thing, even though he, his policies, many of his policies were racist. He embraced Lincoln's nationalism, especially during World War I. He went to Kentucky to visit Lincoln's birthplace. Uh, he kind of made a mess of his speech at the, at the big Gettysburg reunion, but he embraced Lincoln as well, as had his predecessor, Teddy Roosevelt, who after all employed Lincoln's former private secretary, John Hay, as a secretary of state. Mm -hmm. They gave him a lock of Lincoln's hair and a ring that Roosevelt wore all the time. And he talked openly about being inspired by Lincoln. But I think the president who most successfully made it open season was FDR. He consciously told people he wanted Lincoln to be a symbol of the new New Deal Democratic Party. He began thinking that as governor. It was part of his effort to get the black vote, which had been consistently Republican, and I believe remained so even in 1932. But by 1936, had moved to the Democrats with a lot of hard work by, mm -hmm. by Roosevelt and his, uh, his uh, chief African-American advisor, Mary McLeod Bethune, but even in an effort to get America ready for World War II, Lincoln hired as his, Lincoln, sorry, FDR <laughs> hired as his speechwriter, uh, Robert Emmett Sherwood, the Pulitzer Prize winning playwright who wrote Abe Lincoln in Illinois. And Sherwood begins sprinkling references to Lincoln's reluctant but great fight against uh, threats to the country. And, and it's been back and forth ever since. I, it's not only been, you know, Reagan using fake Lincoln uh, uh, writings, alleged writings at a Republican convention, uh, all the way through Bush and Clinton. Mm -hmm. I've had the opportunity to speak to several presidents about Lincoln um, of both parties. And I'm amazed but that how but I'm gratified. I, I don't think, I don't see this as a cynical overreach or a cynical grasping at greatness that's undeserved. I see this as a compliment to Lincoln and I see the aspiration to take inspiration from Lincoln as a positive thing. You don't want current presidents to, to look to Jackson, although some do, or to Fillmore or to Buchanan as their role models. I think right. it's healthy 
that there's a bipartisan uh, aspiration to seek inspiration from from Abraham Lincoln. Well, and I think that feeds to a question I have is a fear among many folks that at some point that may change, or perhaps even we see beginnings of that with the so-called cancel culture, um, the reassessment of a lot of statutes. Um, obviously, there was a, a famous one of Lincoln that has come under a lot of scrutiny, although it's not because of Lincoln per se, but rather how it depicts um, the African-American man in the statue relative to Lincoln. But, but are you at all concerned that this, again, I'll just use that term, cancel culture will eventually come for Lincoln? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm glad you said, you offered a caveat about the phrase, because I don't think this is cancel mm. culture. I think this is re-examining uh, our history. And I think that's a healthy thing. And of right. course, there are extremes involved. There's, you know, unacceptable defacement. And, uh, and uh, although I kind of sympathize with the UNC students who pulled down Silent Sam after all those years of kind of BS discussion about whether it should stay or remain or be moved and nothing ever happened. That statue was dedicated in a wave of vicious racist white supremacist uh, speech making that included a reference by the principal uh, speech, uh, the orator of the day to whipping a, a, a Negro wench for getting saucy with white people to the applause of the crowd. And it was a, a a lousy statue in the first place. And it's meant to, you know, revise the outcome of the Civil War and stand for perpetual white supremacy. So I think taking down statues, even taking down Confederate statues is, is a good thing. I think mm -hmm. it's time that traitors who fought for slavery um, did not get spotlights in the public square, did not sit in front of courthouses to signify, as was the intention when they were erected in the Jim Crow era, to warn people that justice exists in this square for white people and not for people of color. I think that's healthy. And yeah, I know it's got it's morphed into a re-examination of Lincoln, but I'm, I'm happy to engage in the discussion about what Lincoln represented in his time and how advanced he was and how he did the job that nobody else had done, right. which is to right. begin the, the dissolution of slavery and, and move the 13th Amendment forward with all the powers he had and right. sign right. the order. And, yeah. But do you want to talk about that one statue, the Thomas Ball? Well, yeah, I mean, I would, please share your thoughts on that too. I mean, that, I mean we've had a couple uh, episodes on that in this podcast. We'd love to hear your thoughts too. Well, my thoughts are that it's, uh, it's probably outlived its original uh, intent, which is to show the elevation of the person, the black man from slavery to freedom. And I, I remind people that the figure of the kneeling slave was the symbol of the abolitionist movement. Mm. Uh, am I not a brother? And am I not a man and a brother? It was introduced for, by English abolitionists. It was used in the United States. So it was not meant as a, to suggest a subjugated person or be insulting. Was it, could it have been better? Sure. But even if you look at the, the most advanced of the monuments showing Lincoln with African-Americans, the Cleveland Civil War Memorial, which shows Lincoln, I think this is the perfect one. It shows Lincoln standing next to a, a, a member of the U.S. colored troops with a rifle. I mean, that's empowering mm -hmm. to people of color. But even that soldier is on his knees. And whether that means he's shooting at, a, at a, you know, an unseen opponent from a kneeling position or whether Lincoln is just so overpowering he stands above everyone is hard to know. So, you know, it, the statue that was dedicated by Frederick Douglass, the one in Washington, unveiled by Ulysses S. Grant. Um, Douglass wrote a couple of letters saying he didn't like the half-naked slave. So I think it's worth discussing. I don't think it's worth taking down the one in Washington. Right. I think the move to do so in Boston is kind of precipitous, but it's happening all over the country. And, just now in Albany, the mayor of our state capital removed a statue of General Schuyler, who was a hero of the revolution, because it was, uh, it's been discussed that he owned 18 slaves. Uh, most people have forgotten about Philip Schuyler, except to know that he was the father-in-law of Alexander Hamilton. So his name got some play in the Hamilton musical. But, um, you know, the reappraisals are coming after everyone. And... Uh, right. 
high time in some ways. Mm -hmm. Well, I have to say this next question is one I'm probably the most excited to ask about because every time I come across one of your books or think about you, I wonder this, what is your secret to such productive output? The amount of books that you produce is unparalleled in the Lincoln field. And I would argue um, as great as any other in the history field. I mean, you're constantly producing excellent material. And I know a lot of them are edited volumes, but still it, it takes a lot of work and many yeah. of them are straight up author. What's your method for researching and writing and how are you able to keep, keep up such pace? Well, you, I, you're very nice to say that. I think it was meant as a compliment. It is, absolutely. <laughs> I, I remember that I did one book for, um, Har for Simon and Schuster uh, for my late editor there, the very well-known book editor named Alice Mayhew, who died uh, recently. And um, she said, send me a list of the, the books you've written so that we can put them in, you know, also by, right. by Harold, right? And she called me up and said that, um, that she was not going to print the list because she thought it was eccentric. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll never forget that. It was such a great put down in a way. So, I, you know, I don't know. I, I'm very committed to my, to my work. And I have for years and years used almost all of my vacation time to do research. Um, I have a great library uh, of materials close to hand in both my, my homes and my office. Um, the web has helped enormously, but, but you're right. I, I started before there was access to the web, but I, I love research. I love the research I did with, with co-authors. I love doing it alone. Right. And, and I've spent most of my weekends uh, writing. Uh, that's, I, I'm not a leisure person. Um, you know, I watch murder mysteries with my wife at night, but otherwise I spend all day at my keyboard. And I guess, you know, it's either a, a blessing or a disease. I don't know what the... Right. What I, I mean, but from a timing perspective, I mean, obviously you have a normal, I'm assuming eight to five type job. I mean, are you, when, when you get home at, in the evening, do you spend that time, a lot of it, uh, researching and writing, whereas maybe other folks take a walk, watch a TV show, you're, you're doing that work? Well, I should probably take more walks. In fact, <laughs> I was at, my wife asked me to take a walk this morning and I feigned backache so I could get out of it. I wanted to prepare for you. That was my <laughs> So um, um, I don't say my life is normal, but you know, we raised, we raised two daughters. I have two terrific grandsons. Um, Frankly, I have not gotten a lot of work done these last five months, even though I've been locked down like almost everybody else in New York City and New York State. Um, obviously, we can't see our kids and grandkids as much as we want. Mm -hmm. But it's been also a kind of a paralytic time in terms of work. But the shorthand answer is, you know, I do work at a college and it's the first time I've worked at a place where uh, you know, intellectual achievement is part of the job. So mm -hmm. I do spend some time during the day uh, following up on my, on, my, on, my, on my research, but not much. And it's not an eight to five job at its, you know, in its ordinary times when we're all working in, uh, in situ because we have lots of evening events. We have author events, mm. public policy, right. and human rights discussions. So yeah, it's been really a weekend preoccupation. But I will say also when I, when I went to work uh, in uh, almost 30 years ago for the Metropolitan Museum, its director, Philippe de Montebello, um, hired me in part because I had a, a separate life as a writer. And, mm. and I think he, while he teased me endlessly and still does about my quote outside work, he didn't discourage it. He hardly, didn't forbid it. He, you know, he came to book parties and celebrated it. He saw the value of it, certainly. I think he did. And I, you know, as I made me a better representative of the museum to be a person of different facets. I think. Right. Well, with such a large body of work and very, you know, your work with the museum, um, in politics, your authorship, what would you say is your proudest professional accomplishment? And, you know, when it comes time to pin your obituary, what do you feel like deserves particular attention? I guess the National Humanities Medal. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a great, it was a great day. Um, uh, my family was there, and uh, 
I wish my grandson had been a little older. I have a picture of him um, holding the medal, but he was, um, you know, 10 months old. So all we have is the pictures. But th that was a pretty extraordinary moment. I got to hang out with Olivia de Havilland that day and mm -hmm. the Sherman brothers who wrote uh, It's a Small World and Super Califragilist. And Gabor Boric, my, my dear friend who got the, the award on the same day. And um, I think that, and I think, frankly, the, the discussions I've had with other presidents about Lincoln mm -hmm. face to face, which I've used in this book. Um, and, you know, first President Bush, second President Bush, and President Clinton particularly, I've had the opportunity to talk Mm -hmm. to Lincoln and, and, and in the White House and perform in the White House in addition, um, do a Lincoln uh, presentation with Sam Waterston in the White House. That was mm -hmm. pretty, pretty heady day too. But So there have been lots of highlights and lots of exciting moments. I'm very grateful for it. That's great. Well, and one of the other things you've been a part of is in the Lincoln community of starting or leading so many organizations. I know for a long time you were a uh, part of the Abraham Lincoln Association. You've helped start the Lincoln Forum now. Um, and then we've also got the Abraham Lincoln Institute. Um, at least from where I sit, it seems like those are sort of the three preeminent organizations. Do you ever see a time where there might be closer cooperation or marriage between those groups? Or do you think it makes more sense to sort of have them separately? I know this is a little bit inside baseball for us Lincoln historians. Yeah. But, um, but nonetheless, I'm intrigued your, your perspective on that. Well, yeah, um, it's, it's uh, you know, it's like flinching. Who's going to flinch first? Right. Remember those <laughs> games when you were a kid. Right. There have been some efforts. I think um, Lewis Lerman of the Yellow Lerman Institute has really made some nice efforts to have rapprochements. I think everybody is, uh, is pretty okay with each other at this point. We talk. <laughs> Um, it's good to have different institutions with different, uh, not a different agendas, but different programming in, all, mm -hmm. in different parts of the country. I think that's healthy. And I think um, you see people uh, on, on the boards of several of the organizations at once. Right. And I can right. point to a number of them who are in the ALA and the Lincoln Forum, uh, who are in the uh, Abraham Lincoln Institute and on um, Lincoln Forum. Um, mm -hmm. Jonathan White is one. Uh, he's, you know, a board right. member, an officer of, of the ALI, and he's the vice chairman of the Lincoln Forum. I think he may so, be on the all threes board, actually, if I'm not mistaken. Well, if there was a fourth board, I'm sure he'd be on that too. Yeah. <laughs> an active guy. But I think, um, I think in a way, the Lincoln Bicentennial effort, which I also co-chaired with, uh, uh, for 10 years, really, um, with, uh, with Dick Durbin and Ray LaHood, and the foundation that emanated from that was a good unifying experience. And uh, we, uh, as, a, as, a fund, as a fund dispensing organization, supported organizations, you know, regardless of past, mm -hmm. you know, acrimony or, or arguments. So, yeah, I think, I think we're in a better place and I don't think it's necessary to have an omnibus a uh, group that controls everything and pulls all the strings. The more the merrier. Sure. Well, w we often like to end these podcasts with the question of um, uh, what, is, what would be your favorite Lincoln story or Lincoln anecdote? And so I'd, I'm very intrigued to hear how you might answer that question. Can I tell an anecdote about another president as relates to Lincoln? That'd be fine. Yeah. <laughs> not, to, not to do name dropping, but uh, <laughs> I've been trying to get this story in since we began. And this is, I'm not going to take this opportunity. <laughs> okay. So we did this uh, Lincoln Seen and Heard program, Sam Waterston and I, across the country and um, did it at many venues, but also at the White House, uh, at the uh, uh, Bush won presidential library as it was being conceived uh, and at the Clinton library in Little Rock. And every time we did it, a president had a different reaction. Hmm. What was powerful? What stood out? And the most extraordinary reaction I got, which I will never forget, was from uh, President George H.W. Bush. And this program which you know you, anybody could see just by going on C-SPAN because the White House version exists in its archive, is a compendium of great quotes, great 
excerpts of Lincoln speeches accompanied by images that relate to each speech. So I introduce, I talk about the image, and then Sam Waterston would read the speeches. So after it was over, George H.W. Bush came backstage to thank us with tears in his eyes. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty moving. And we said, Mr. President, what, what moved you to this degree? I mean, politely and not too inquisitively. And he said, the farewell address to Springfield. Now that was the first answer of that. That was the first such answer we'd ever had. And we said, really, why? And he said, because Lincoln says, here my children have been born and one lies buried. And no one except Lincoln understood what it was like for a president, a newly elected president, to leave the grave of his child and go to Washington. And then he began to cry again. Wow. And it never occurred to me. And it just reminded me again how much and how important it is that modern leaders take solace, inspiration, and instruction from the greatest president of them all. That was a pretty powerful moment for me. That's a remarkable, that is a really remarkable story and um, in and of itself, but I, I want to, uh, I guess, support why I called you a rock star. I think you, more than any other Lincoln historian, I, I know at your speeches, you'll, you'll have literal rock stars attend, uh, former presidents, folks from pop culture who I feel like you um, draw into your work to a degree that, uh, you know, so many of us other historians, I mean, we sort of speak to other historians or we try and reach the popular culture, but I think you've taking it to that next level. And, um, and the more you can sort of popularize Lincoln and his message and what he stood for, more power to you and kudos for that. You're certainly doing a good job of it. Thank you. You're very kind. It helps to be in New York, kind of the epicenter of, of, the, of the culture world. But yeah, I've had a lot of entertainment figures um, participate in programs and right. uh, follow, follow Lincoln as never before. Right, I'm proud right. of that. I hope we don't lose that. Well, I can't recommend enough your newest book. Um, your publisher was kind enough to send me a copy and I'm about two thirds of the way through and, and loving it. Um, to remind our listeners again, it's called The Presidents Versus the Press, The Endless Battle Between the White House and the Media from the Founding Fathers to Fake News. You can pick that up at your local independent bookstore or Amazon or any of the big box stores, wherever it's most convenient for you. Um, very highly recommend it. Uh, Harold, thank you again so much. Uh, um, I, uh, this is a wonderful discussion. Let's do it again. It was fun. No, thank you. Thank you for listening to Lincoln Log. You can subscribe to the podcast in iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. And if you like this podcast, please consider rating it on iTunes and leaving a review. This helps other people find the show. 